What's up, everybody? Hey, just finished, man, speaking a message at our Atlanta location, man. Woo! It was called Strange Faith. Man, I want you to tap into this. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. If this blesses you, just share it with somebody else. Listen, if the gift of speaking that God's given me is adding value to your life, I want you to be a part of something called Rock the World with Words because I want to spend five days sharing with you some of the things God's taught me about how to be impactful through speaking. The Lord Thirst on the screen, man. Tap in, sign up. I'll see you soon. Take care. Go with me into the book of Matthew, chapter number eight, beginning at verse five. I am um, concluding a series today. I think I'm concluding it. I might, I'm in Jersey this coming Wednesday for fire night. I may, I may spin the block. I don't know, but, uh, but this is the last Sunday in this series, at least called Stranger Things. I want to read a few verses in the book of Matthew, chapter eight, verse number five. I want, how y'all doing? Y'all feel like talking back to the preacher today or no? What's, it's 12 o'clock. How we doing? We straight? Come on. This is the 12. We, you came to the 12. We don't have no service behind this. We just, if we feel like praising them, we just praise them. <laughs> yeah, you say, I came to church because I came to church. I didn't come to sit. I came to church. I didn't come to look. I came to church. I came because God's got something for me and I want absolutely everything he has in store for my life. So let's go 12 o'clock. Matthew 8 verse number 5 says, When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed. He is suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The, the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I tell this one go and he goes. And I tell that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. And he said to those following him, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I want to talk from this subject in our time together, family. Don't miss this strange faith. Clap your hands if you're ready for God's word. Family, I want to I want to ease into this introduction by informing some and reminding others that the actions of God are intentional. Somebody say intentional. By that, I'm simply suggesting that his actions are never an end unto themselves. They are always a means to an end. That whenever he is doing anything, he's not just doing that thing that you know about he's doing the thing that you know about because he's also doing the thing you don't know about he's intentional and because he's intentional whenever he's doing something he's doing something because he's intentional but because he's also intentional whenever he's doing nothing He's doing something. Because if he's doing nothing, he's doing nothing intentionally. So when he's doing something, he's doing something. But when he's doing nothing, he's doing something. And when you get this revelation, it causes a revolution in your praise. Because I not only praise him when he's doing something, because he's doing something. I'll also praise him when he's doing nothing. Because if he's doing nothing, he's doing something. So he's doing something when he's doing something, and he's doing something when he's doing nothing. So I'll bless the Lord at all times. And I just need to pause even in this introduction, because we need to upset the enemy in this room. 
because the enemy wants you to think God's doing nothing because he's doing nothing. But I want somebody to praise him, not because doors are swinging open, not because everything is trending in the right direction. I want some people who feel like, God, what are you waiting on to pause for the cause and say, I just got a revelation. If you're doing nothing, you're doing something. So I'm going to praise you when you're doing something, and I'm going to praise you when you're doing nothing. Somebody praise him because he's doing nothing. He's intentional. So he doesn't do things randomly or haphazardly. His actions are always intentional. And there's something I see that he does regularly and repeatedly all throughout scripture. He regularly and repeatedly gives you a revelation of who you are. If you look, are y'all hearing me? If you objectively observe scripture, you will see that God not only talks about who he is to you, he also talks about you to you regarding who you are. It's as if he's saying it's not enough for you to know who I am. If I'm going to do strange things in your life, you got to know who you are. Don't y'all miss this. Why, Darius? Because the scriptures say, as a man, don't y'all mess with me. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Y'all, did, It didn't say as God thinks about a man. It says as a man come on, thinks about himself. So it's he. In other words, you will always behave in a way that is consistent with how you see you. Did you hear what I just said? And so because God understands this, he regularly and repeatedly and consistently keeps telling you who you are because he's trying to wash your brain of your revelation of you so he can renew your mind with his revelation of you so you can start behaving in a way that is consistent with how he sees you and not consistent with how you see yourself. Don't miss this. For some of you, the devil has not been after your revelation of God. For some of you, the devil has been after your revelation of you. He's not just trying to stop you from getting a revelation of who God is. He's trying to stop you from getting a revelation of who you are because he knows if you ever line up the right revelation with God, with the right revelation of you, eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard. See, you think the attacks on your esteem are random. You don't realize that the attacks on your self-esteem is an expression of spiritual warfare. It is Satan saying, I got to do all I can to keep them from seeing who they are. Because if they ever see who they are. Out of all the words... The Bible uses to describe you. Common, not one of them. Salt, light, chosen, royal, peculiar, special, beloved, anointed, appointed, selected, elected, protected, blessed, not cursed, above only, not beneath, head, not tail, lender, not borrower. Out of all of the words that he uses to describe you, normal is not one of them. Out of all the words that are used to describe, I don't even have time to deal with this. Did you hear what I just said? You live on your level of revelation. And if he can stop you from getting the right revelation, he knows he can stop you from experiencing a revolution in your life. Almost everything you do is a reflection of how you see you. I don't have time. 
The stuff you tolerate in relationships. Y'all not, y'all not ready at 12. I said the stuff you take and tolerate is a revelation of the way you see you. Because you don't take stuff you don't think you have to. I don't. Did you hear what I said? Because one of the ways the devil gets you to lower your standards is by making your options invisible. So if he can keep you from seeing you got options, he will... If he can keep you from sin, you got options. Then he will cause you to lower your standard. Because a low standard is a revelation that a person don't believe, I got options. And the fact that God can make a way out of no way means that there are options that exist that you don't even see yet. Just because you don't see options doesn't mean God doesn't have options. And that's why your blessing is never tied to what happens through one person. God will find somebody somewhere that is willing and able to obey him and bless you. You got options. Y'all better come get me today. You got options. You might be in a situation like Elijah, he'll cause a raven to feed you. When people won't do it, he'll cause a bird to do it. And people feed birds, birds don't feed people. But when God gets ready to do something in your life, he will make a thing behave in a way that's inconsistent with its nature. He'll make takers become givers. He'll make door closers become door openers. He will make a thing behave in a way that's inconsistent with his nature because you got options. All throughout scripture, he's trying to get you and I to see you're not better than. You're different from. Not better than. Different from. I'm not better than. Different from. So uncommon isn't I'm better than. Uncommon is I'm different from. Strange isn't I'm better than. Strange is I'm different from. Because all the words the Bible uses to describe you, they align with uncommon. You are uncommon in your creation. When you look at what's called the creation narrative in Genesis, some say this is literal, some say this is metaphorical, it has no consequence. So whether it's seven days literally or, as Peter says, a day to the Lord is like a thousand years, whether it's over a period of a thousand years. The point of Genesis in the creation narrative is over an extended period of time, God, our creator, created the universe as we know it. And when you look at him creating everything he created in Genesis, you will see everything he created, he spoke into existence. He used his mouth until it got to you. On the first day, he used his mouth. On the second day, he let there be. On the second day, he used his mouth. Let there be. On the third day, use his mouth. Let there be. On the fourth day, use his mouth. Let there be. On the fifth day, use his mouth. Let there be. On the sixth day, he say, I'm not using my mouth for this one. Let us make man in our own image. I'm going to use my hands. I'm going to get down in the dirt. Because what I'm getting ready to do with this creation, he's got to have his hand, my hands on him. And I don't know who this is for, but I need you to know that you've been uncommon in your creation. That God customized you. Jeremiah said, he says to Jeremiah, before I form you in the womb, I knew you. Watch what he says. I form you. Your parents made you. But I form you. Y'all missed it. He says, once your parents did the act to conceive you, everything else was out of their control. What your gifts were, that was me. Your height, that was me. Come on. Your tendencies, that was me. They made you. I formed you. And I formed you for a function. I created you for a calling. I built you by design. I wired you for a work. And you have some dysfunction because you're not perfect. But you don't have a deficit. Y'all missed it. I'm going to say that one more time. 
You're not perfect, so you got some dysfunction, but you do not have a deficit. God has put in latent form on the inside of you absolutely everything you need to be who he has called you to be. You've been customizing your creation, but when you try to settle in a place called normal, you are undermining the impact of your uniqueness. He said, everything I did with you, I did on purpose. Your personality is purposeful. You don't get that revelation, you'll see your personality as a liability. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, see, see, I am, so I'm not like an introvert, I'm what's called an ambivert. Got me? So I need, for me, I need, I need to be around people. Then I need to not be around people. <laughs> ah, ah, it's like, okay. All right. Now, watch this. The reason I need to withdraw is to refuel right so I replenish in isolation but once I'm replenished I'm ready to re-engage does that make sense so it's like I can't be with people too long I can't be with myself too long it's I'm an ambivert those are words but see some people will look at that and say you confused you complicated what I'm saying is that God knew my assignment require that kind of personality that's what I just said because as a teacher I need to be okay in isolation because that's how you read y'all missed it that's how you learn that's how you grow so if I was not okay in isolation I would not be able to fill my well with wisdom that I could release to the people but if I'm going to shepherd people, I cannot be awkward with people. So I need to be introvert enough to get the information. But I need to be extroverted enough to be okay with people and releasing them. Y'all are missing this because your personality is purposeful. God knew what he was doing when he made you. Somebody say, I'm uncommon. Yeah, uncommon. And God wants to do uncommon things. And the word that we're using to describe this uncommon intention of our eternal God is a word called strange. And we've talked about some principles and prerequisites to experience strange things. And we said, number one, we told you this in week one, if you're going to experience strange things, strange things require living with a sixth sense. And then last week we taught you if you're going to experience strange things, strange things require living with a strong no. And on today I want to share with you that if we're going to experience strange things, strange things require strange faith. Will you allow me to unpack what I mean by faith? Come on, I said, did you? Because faith is one of the most important terms and most important concepts in scripture. You cannot get life right if you're getting faith wrong. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, you don't have to understand like eschatology and the end times and when Jesus coming back, coming back. That may not, that doesn't affect your daily life. But if you get faith wrong, this affects everything. Am I making sense here? Yeah, yeah. See, what most people don't know is that after God... God's top two desire, God's top desire from his people, number one, is to be loved. The second desire is to be believed. He says, you can't please me without believing me. Without faith. Don't mess with me on this front row. It's impossible to please God. And so many people confuse faith with optimism. Faith makes you optimistic, but faith is not optimism. Many people confuse faith with positive thinking. Faith helps you think positively, but faith is not positive thinking. 
Many people confuse faith with good vibes. And faith will give you good vibes, but good vibes is not faith. The Bible clearly communicates in the book of Hebrews that faith has an author and a finisher. Author meaning it comes from somewhere. Finisher means it goes into someone. Don't y'all miss this. It has an author and a finisher. It comes from someone and it goes back into someone. And the writer of Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Optimism says it's going to work out. Somehow, some way, it's going to work out. Faith has an author and a finisher. Faith doesn't say it's going to work out. Faith says God is going to work it out. Faith says it's not going to happen randomly. It's not going to happen haphazardly. Faith doesn't say the universe is going to do it. Faith says the one who made the universe. He's getting ready to take what the enemy meant for evil and work it for my good. God can't be pleased without it. Salvation can't be experienced without it. It is by grace through faith you are saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. That God deposits salvation into the account of every human, but faith is the withdrawal slip that allows you to access what has been deposited. Grace deposits it, but faith withdraws it. Faith is a belief or trust that produces a corresponding action. It is a belief or trust that produces a corresponding action. The way you know is faith and not optimism is that faith produces a corresponding action called works. See, just because you call it faith doesn't mean God agrees. You're like, God, I got faith. He's like, you have optimism. God, I got faith. You got positive vibes. He says, because if you move from optimism to faith, faith so grips your heart that it produces an action that aligns with what you say you believe. If you believe I'm getting ready to make it rain, you start building an ark. The building of the ark is evidence that you really believe that I'm going to make it rain. If you believe he's going to do some great things in your future, then you start doing things in your present that align with what you believe. And some of us don't see God's trying to use your behavior as a mirror to show you your faith. James puts it this way. He says, I'm going to show you my faith by my works. It has an author and the finisher. And the strength of my faith is tied to my revelation of the credibility of the one my faith is in. I'm going to say this. Two people in your life can tell you the same thing. You believe one. <laughs> and not believe the other. They can say the same thing. <laughs> and you believe one. <laughs> and not believe the other. Same word. But your belief in the word is tied to the credibility of the one speaking it. If the one speaking it has a reputation of not keeping their word, no matter how much they say it, you won't believe it. But if the one speaking the word has a reputation of always keeping their word, 
then the credibility increases and so does your belief. God says not to believe me says to me my credibility is still questionable with you. Spicy. <laughs> Here is a definition of faith that is an adaptation from one I read years ago from Dr. Tony Evans. Faith is acting like God is telling the truth all the time about everything. Woo! Faith is acting like God is telling the truth all the time about everything. Not some things, not most things, everything. He's telling the truth about what he'll do in my body. He's telling the truth about what he'll do in my mind. He's telling the truth about what he'll do in my ministry. He's telling the truth about what he'll do in my heart. When he said no weapon formed against you shall prosper, he was telling the truth. And when he said every tongue that rises in judgment, I will condemn. You don't have to refute it. When I'm with you, I'll refute it myself. He was telling the truth. Did you hear what I just said? I said faith is acting like God is telling the truth. This is why I believe you cannot have a heart filled with faith and not have a mouth filled with praise. Praise is faith talk. Some people speak Spanish. Some people speak German. Some people speak French. Some people speak Portuguese. But some of us speak praise. Praise is the language of faith. Praise says, I believe that you are telling the truth all the time about everything. We all need faith. But all faith is not the same. And an example of this is seen in our text here in the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew exposes us to an experience that a Roman military soldier has with Jesus. And the Bible says that this Roman military soldier, a centurion, comes to Jesus in Capernaum. And this centurion was a Roman military official that oversaw 100 soldiers. So he was rich in influence. He was probably affluent because he had servants. However, his influence influence and his affluence couldn't address this issue. This issue was a revelation of his limitation but there are times where God will arrange a limitation to set up a situation so he could give you a revelation of him that you never had before. So this is why when you're trying to make it happen God won't let you make it happen. When you're trying to make it work God won't let you make it work because God's like I'm using this limitation as a situation to give you a revelation of me that you didn't have before this is why your networking won't work this is why you can't write a check to fix this this is why you can't call your friend to fix this because this is a job for God I don't know who I'm speaking to right now who might be frustrated because of your limitations I want you to know that God will arrange situations to give you a revelation of him that you didn't have before and revelations cause revolutions in your life because revelation exposes you to something you hadn't been exposed before and once you've been, been exposed you can't be unexposed once you've learned that he's a healer you can't unlearn it once you've learned that he's a provider you can't unlearn it once you've learned that he's a way maker you can't unlearn it this is the way they would say it in the church I grew up in excuse me let me go all the way back to the Mount Olive Missionary Baptist Church in Kill Michael Mississippi you can't make me doubt it <laughs> I know too much about him devil is too late you should have never let me get a revelation of who he was because once I get exposed I can't be unexposed the centurion comes to Jesus and says I have a servant that's paralyzed and suffering he's paralyzing He's paralyzed, meaning he's immobile. He's stuck. Time moving, but he not. 
New year, same problem. New boo, different name, same person. I felt something right over here. Let me say that get tired. Yeah, 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 come on. <laughs> it's like, this the same, you, you, the, you a different, same person. <laughs> you, I keep picking you. Why do I like what's killing me? <laughs> he's paralyzed. Time's moving. But he's not. Have you ever felt like time was moving? And you're not. What's scary is this man was paralyzed, but he wasn't blind. His legs didn't work, but his eyes did. So this means he has to lay still watching others move around. It's one thing for you to feel stuck and everybody's stuck. It's another thing for you to feel stuck and you got to watch other people move. And because you're not a hater, you're not mad that they moving but you confused as to why you not. God, I'm not hating, but I got questions. Where, where is the real section today? I promise you, I want you to do everything that you got in store for them. Bless them, keep them, elevate them, open doors for them. I'm not hating, but I have some questions. The servant is paralyzed, Marlon, so he's suffering. That's the text. He's paralyzed, he's stuck and suffering, as if to suggest that the stuckness and the suffering are connected. That I can't ease the suffering till I fix the stuckness. Because some problems are secondary problems not primary problems. And secondary problems don't get fixed until you deal with the primary problem. It's like the woman in Mark 5 that had the issue of blood. The Bible says the issue of blood caused her to spend all that she had. So she had an economic issue that was a secondary problem. Until she fixed the primary problem, the secondary problem would never be fixed. Because even if she earned more, she would still have to spend more. Because she still had the primary problem. And the devil wants us obsessed with these secondary problems and not the primary problems. And this is what makes, are y'all catching this? This is what makes dealing with God so confusing because the devil wants us to obsess with the secondary and not the primary. But when you come to God, you come to God because of the secondary. Because paralyzation doesn't mean you're in pain, but suffering does. So you come to God for the suffering because the secondary thing is often the thing that's affecting you the most. And God's like, even though you came to me for the secondary, I'm not dealing with the secondary yet. You're going to have to hurt a little while so that you don't have to hurt a long time after this let me say, so I'm gonna deal with the primary I know you want me to fix the thing that's hurting you quickly but I'm gonna deal with the root of that thing so that you don't have to keep dealing with that thing season after season after season he's paralyzed y'all okay I got four minutes he's paralyzed and he's suffering and Jesus asked the man are y'all ready for this yeah 12 o'clock are y'all ready for this Jesus asked the man shall I go and heal him it's in the text he said my man he said he's suffering Jesus said shall I come and heal him this is a question that is a picture of what's called the permissive will of God it is referring to an aspect of the will of God that is preferential but not mandatory God's like I will 
but I don't have to. So it's not just on me. It's on you. It's like, God, I got a problem. You want to do something about it? <laughs> Did you hear what I said? Because what God realizes is that some of us want attention, not intervention. That's why some of your friends get agitated with you. Because you like, listen, do you want to talk or do you want some help? I love you, but we've been talking about this same thing. I'm going to be here for you. But we having the same conversation over and over. I told you to leave them alone. I told you to leave that alone. Now, do you want some help or not? He says, shall I come? And the man, and the man says, no, I'm not a follower of Yahweh. I'm Roman. We roll a little different in Rome. I don't want you to come to my house. You come to my house, you might see some stuff I got to explain. I'm trying to see how far I should... Jesus, it's some stuff I don't want to explain. <laughs> the ethics and the morals in Rome were completely different than, than, than the ethics for followers of Yahweh. So he's like, listen, it's a little ratchetness in Rome, Jesus. So you see a man who doesn't have a perfect life, but he's perfected faith. Can I go here? Yeah. It's about to be spicy. Are you sure? Yeah. See, there are some people that are doing better than us. Not because they live better than us. They believe better. Yeah. You just mi you missed what I just said. Uh -huh. Righteous living has its own reward. And that is you don't suffer the consequences of living unrighteously. But righteous living does not substitute, is not a substitute for faith. God doesn't owe you because you lived right. <sighs> Y'all aren't talking to me. Some of you are trying to use ethics to get you what only faith can get you. God's like, you need to live right because that protects you from the consequences of not living right. So righteousness has its own reward. Because righteous standards of the Father are the floor, not the ceiling anyway. He's like, so you want me to bless you because you don't lie? The reward of not lying is that your credibility is not undermined. I didn't get blessed for not being lying. Yes, you can be trusted. And some doors open for you simply because you can be trusted. Did you hear what I just said? Lord, I've been living right and you. You say, you ain't been doing that for me? That's so you not in love with the wrong person. That's so you not addicted to something that's going to destroy your life. That's so you can keep your reputation. Let me wrap up. <laughs> Because if you don't get this, you're going to be confused as to why you in Israel and somebody else in Rome and they getting stuff from God, you ain't.
because he know he doesn't deserve it and you think you do he knew he needed grace <laughs> he knew he needed grace so he comes knowing he doesn't deserve it we come entitled you owe me I deserve and God's like so you want to talk about what you deserve <laughs> where is the real let they ready <laughs> he said so you want to talk about what you deserve you want to talk about all the stuff I covered up <laughs> you don't want to talk about how the stuff they talking about it's just a small portion of what really happened and if what really happened had got out y'all not talking to me today He comes to Jesus and say, no, don't come to my house. He say, I understand something. He say, I'm in authority. So when I say go, those that are under my authority go. And when I say come, those that are under my authority come. So because I understand authority, I know the power of your word. So I know other people need you to come to their house because that's the way their faith works. But because of the way my mind is set up. <laughs> See, this man, this man was not a Jew, so he had to hear about Jesus' exploits in order to pursue him. So maybe he heard about the woman with the issue of blood who said within herself, if I may touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. Remember, she never touched him. She touched what was touching him. Because that's... <laughs> she didn't touch him. She touched what was touching him. Because... <laughs> She touched what was touching him. But when she touched what she what, what she touched what was touching him, he stopped and looked back and said, Who touched me? And the disciples say, All these people touching you. What you mean? It's a crowd. Everybody touching you. He said, No, I felt virtue go out of me. In other words, I know a lot of people touching me, but when faith touched me, it feels different. I know everybody doing the same thing, but when they do it with faith, it get a different result. I ain't even try to heal her. She got a healing on accident. He didn't even know who it was. He had to turn around and say, who touched me? And the centurion probably said, I heard about that, but I don't need that. I heard when Peter's mother-in-law was sick, you went and laid hands on her. I, I heard that, but I, I don't need that. I heard about the 12 year old girl that you went, Jairus' daughter, that you went and healed after you healed with a woman that issued blood. You went into the room. I don't need that. Because faith not only determines what you get, faith determines how you get it. God said, I did it that way not because it took, it takes that way. I did it that way because your faith required it to happen that way. Woman with the issue of blood, I could have healed you another way, but your faith was attached to touching me. So that's... So that became your point of contact. But there's nothing miraculous. I don't care how many people trying to sell them to you. There's nothing miraculous in the... There's nothing miraculous in the garment itself. It was her faith that said, I need to touch what's touching him. Because Jesus didn't tell the woman, my garment made you whole. <laughs> he looked at the woman and said, your faith, your faith did this. So I know that happened, but I don't need that. I don't need, Centurion's like, I don't need that. I'm straight. I don't need that. I understand the word. Just like I speak to a soldier, they got to do with what I say. When you speak to my servant body, it's got to do what you say. I don't have FaceTime, so I can't even see what's happening with him over there. I just believe when you speak the word right now, by the time I walk in my house, Everything you said is going to come to pass. You're not hearing what I'm saying. See, some of you think God's got to do it a certain way. But if you will get, 
your faith out of the box and you'll get in a strange faith. You won't look at a situation and say, it's going to take me 12 years. You can say, it took them 12 years. But the way my faith is set up, God's going to do it in 12 months. I'm done, Tario. And the Bible says Jesus was amazed. Normally, we're amazed at Jesus. Jesus was amazed at the man. He said, I ain't seen faith like this in all the churches I've been in. He said, this is a different kind of, this not common faith. See, all faith isn't the same. There's a type of faith I call sour faith. It's when faith is gone sour. It is when disappointment about what didn't happen in the past sours your belief about what can happen in the future. Did you hear what I just said? It is when your experience has more authority over your belief system than God's word. Sour faith. I believed, but I went through a season where believing didn't work. And now my faith has soured. Now I'm like Martha, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Then there's saving faith, which is belief in the salvation of the soul but not the transformation of my situation it is a faith that that believes that God can watch this get me to heaven but not change things on earth it is a belief that Jesus is with me in my suffering but does nothing about my suffering it's a belief that I only get relief in the by and by That faith gets you to heaven, but you go through hell all the way there. Then there's safe faith. This is an unbelief. This is limited belief. This is really a faith that rests in what you can do, not what God can. So you believe, but your belief is really belief in God helping you do what you believe you can do with a little bit of help. <laughs> safe faith produces safe goals. <laughs> uh, I think last fall, Pastor Shamik and I were riding and um, we were in Lafayette, Louisiana, I think. And we were with our, um, we were riding with our real estate uh, mentor, our real estate investment coach. And um, there was this property we had invested in there, and we riding, and she got, she got, she got, she got crazy faith. And so we ride. She say, uh, "So how many doors you believing for?" <laughs> I'm the pastor now. <laughs> so how many doors you believing for? And. Uh, she driving I told her she just look at me she's like that sounds safe cause I believed it was possible y'all missed it I believed it was possible not cause God could do it I believed it was possible <laughs> with a little bit of help I can do this it was a safe goal and I'm acting like I'm trying to protect God's reputation, but what I'm really trying to protect is my disappointment. I don't want to set a goal too high and I don't reach it. So I start believing safe. But your protection becomes your prison. And you limit yourself to what God can do. But the final kind of faith is strange faith. And this is a faith that doesn't rest on your previous experience, but this faith rests solely on the authority of the Word of God. 
It is a faith, watch this, that works not without doubt, but beyond it. Y'all missed it. It's the faith that says, I've been fishing in this pond all day. I ain't caught nothing. But since you said, I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm letting down the net because you said so. I don't know what's going to come out of this, but nevertheless, at your word, beyond my doubt. And what God wants to do is to take you and I from faith to faith and from glory to glory. Maybe you're in sour faith. Maybe you're in saving faith. Maybe you're in safe faith. What God wants to get you to is strange faith. Can I give you three keys to get there? Number one, if you're going to have strange faith, you must have meditation on the word. I don't even have time to unpack meditation, but meditation didn't begin in Eastern religions. I can show you in Joshua what God tells Joshua, meditate on my word day and night and you shall make your way prosperous and you will have good success. It means that you, it means according to the book of Romans, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So you can't believe God to do what you don't know he wants to do. You've got to keep hearing. And some of you, your faith isn't strange enough because you don't hear enough. It's 168 hours a week and you want to be full of faith and the only time you hear the word is this one hour? Meditate. Day and night. Day and night. The notes I take in my devotion time, I practice something called the daily office. office three In the morning and I have to pause in the middle of the day, I got to go back over it. Because by the time, the way my day is set up, Ethan, by the time I spend time with Jesus in the morning, by one o'clock, I need to... Uh, Run it back. I was feeling really great early this morning. Right about now, run it back. And then before I go to bed at night, let me, one more time, meditate. So meditation on the word. Number two, limitation of negative voices. Now I'm going to tell you, many people aren't going to have the courage to actually do this. Because some of you do not have the courage to limit those you love their access is feeding your unbelief and when I'm in a season where I need strange faith I have to limit interaction with negative voices because some people help me believe less that's not where I need help And then last but not least, there has to be impartation of the gift. I want you to look at Romans chapter 1. Y'all got a little time today? I want you to look at Romans chapter 1, verse number 11. Paul says, I long to see you so that I might impart some spiritual gift to you. You heard the word, we probably throw it around in church a lot, impartation. It's like a blood transfusion. It is when the Holy Spirit transmits something to you that you did not possess and one of the things that God imparts Romans 1 11, is spiritual gifts Paul told Timothy stir up the gift did he not did he not say that that lies within you that was given to you by the laying on of hands of the presbytery that's the whole scripture it's an impartation it is this idea that in different seasons in life you may you may need different abilities that can only come from the Holy Spirit and he will release that ability when the season you in demands it and some of you in a season where regular faith don't cut it some of you are regular faith works safe faith working for you right now some of us in a season well the only way you're going to stay sane is if your faith gets strange. (laughs) 
And in Romans 12, 9, when Paul's listing a bunch of spiritual gifts, no, 1 Corinthians 12, 9, when he's listing a bunch of spiritual gifts, when he's talking about gifts of miracles and gifts of heal and healings, he mentions, Kwani mentions a gift of faith. And I'm like, man, people just skip right over that. It is when God releases a unique and uncommon ability to believe him in unique and uncommon ways. I don't know what this is like because several years ago I was in Auckland, New Zealand speaking. <laughs> and I was speaking at the conference and another gentleman from Guatemala was speaking at the conference and when this man from Guatemala got up and spoke and he started talking about courage and faith and I thought Pastor Shamika was with me but it was, also, it was um, another one of uh, guys from my team that was with me and when he was talking I, watch this his faith exposed my lack of it because I looked at the guy that was with me and I said I used to believe like that but we had gone through such a series of challenges especially in New Jersey in that time we had bought land and an entire community rose against us um, they didn't want a church like ours coming into a community like that it was brutal in the paper people following me to my like it was bad and I didn't realize how that disappointment soured my faith and how I vacillated from sour faith to safe faith but I was in a season where God was requiring my wife and I to make a major leap of faith and I'm like, I don't have four or five years to get this back. We got to make a decision soon. And so as he was talking, I said to the guy that was with me, I said to Rankin, I said, man. No, I said, first of all, I said to God, I like fleeced. I was like, okay, Lord, I know you want to do this for me. If he says he wants to pray for the gift of faith of the congregation, I'm receiving it. That's how I know you want to do this for me. And that's how I know you want pass, uh, me and my family to take this step of faith. So I wait to the end of service. He don't pray. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, that didn't work out the way I expected. <laughs> we go to dinner afterwards. We're sitting down in a restaurant in the hotel. I'm sitting next to him. We're talking about the message. And he looks at me. And he says, I feel like he was from Guatemala. He said, I feel like God wants me to pray over you to receive the spiritual gift of faith. And that man prayed for me. And I didn't feel electricity, but something shifted in me. I don't know if I got less fearful. I just got more courageous. And I've watched God. Honor. The working of that gift. Hey, I want to thank you for watching. And I want to encourage you to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of our streams and any of our videos. All right, if this message bless you, do me a favor, share it with somebody else. I'll see you next time.